Anyway, he's not happy to stay. Like, like, she's like, no, but he's really happy. Like, so he's speaking to the uh, let's pick up where we left off, uh, finish 9.01, and we can start 9.02. Uh, Okay, page eight, um, number two. Okay, so uh, suppose that the number of unnecessary procedures recommended by five doctors in the one month period are 2, 2, 8, 10, and 18. But then uh, we ask the sixth doctor and find out they recommend 35 procedures. So this is what we consider an outlier uh, because it's it's way out further than the majority of the, uh, the data here. So it says, how will mean, median and mean be, be affected? And we talked about yesterday how uh, median does a better job of adjusting to outliers. It's not as influenced by outliers as mean is. Mean is uh, like if you have a number that's really out there, it's going to really push that average out. So, um, uh, let's, but let's just, you know, do an example where we can actually see that uh, comparison. So, let's just look at the first um, five doctors here. And let's find the mean and let's find the median. And then we can add in the sixth doctor and then we can compare it to see um, um, how these are both influenced. Okay. So to find the mean, we can add these five numbers together and divide it by five. So let's find the mean. So 40 is the total divided by five. So the mean is eight. And the median, what's the median? Eight as well, right? So we're just looking at these five numbers here. The middle number is eight. Now let's add in the sixth, the, the sixth doctor. So 40 plus 35 divided by 6 is 12.5. So we see that there is a bit of a jump. That that 35 is really pushing that mean out a few values out. But the median, 2, 2, 8, 10, 18, 35, what's the median? We're using these six numbers is actually what just nice. So we see that the median is not so influenced by this large number, right? So this so when there's an outlier, the median kind of does a better job of identifying the, the true center, um, you know, not getting pushed too far out by that um, uh, by that outlier. Okay, and the next up, uh, how will IQR and mean absolute deviation be affected? So anything dealing with mean is going to be influenced uh, more heavily by the outlier, but IQR typically is not going to, right? It's the, uh, IQR is related to the median, so it's not as influenced. So let's just, again, compare the differences here and just convince ourselves that um, IQR and median is a better fit uh, whenever there's an outlier involved. Okay, but let's do the first five doctors. IQR, so um, 
I'll put the data here. Two, two, eight, and eighteen. We know the median, the Q2 is eight. What's Q1? Two, yeah. It's the median of the two numbers here, the same number, so it won't, won't change. Okay, there's two numbers uh, with the upper quartile. What's Q3 going to be? 14, right, between 10 and 18. So IQR, we, what numbers do we subtract when we do IQR? Q3 minus Q1, yeah, so 14 minus 12, sorry, 14 minus 2 is 12. Okay, I'm going to skip the steps for all because uh, it takes a while, but we know that with MAD, uh, with MAD, we are taking the average, right, and we're subtracting each 8 minus 2, 8 minus 2, 8 minus 8, 8 minus 10, and we're adding all that up and dividing by 5, so um, MAD is 4.8. But let's do the IQR with the six doctors. So looking at our new data set here. 2, 2, 8, 10, 18, 35. What's the median? Q2 is what? Fine. So that means all three numbers are part of a lower and upper quartile. Q1 is 2. Q3 is 18, 18 minus 2 is 16, that is not here. So we do, we do see IQR being impacted, but here Matt, you know, uh, the MAD in, uh, increases by, you know, pretty much half, right? Double, right? It, it doubles the the mean absolute deviation because that, that 35 is really pushing everything out um, further to the right. So if there's an outlier, which is a number that is really far out away from the rest of the data, um, median and IQR um, are better fits, are, are, are better um, ways to, to find the middle of your data. Okay. All right, so let's go to page. Um, sorry, there's a a blank page on nine, so let's go to page 10. OK, so uh, what, what are the median and mean salaries? Um, I'll just go ahead and. Get to the. Uh, interpretation here. The median is finding the middle number. Mean, mean is finding the average and it says why are there such different? Why are these such different numbers? And what's the reasoning? Yeah, that outlier is really influenced the mean a lot more heavily than the median.
Okay, which measure of center is the better pick for this data? Be the median. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, we know the process for mean absolute deviation. Uh, today we're going to talk about standard deviation, which we're going to start off with the same steps as mean absolute deviation. We just have to do two more things additional to it, um, but um, we'll skip this step for now. Um, but we know the process, right? We subtract um, each of the values with the mean. We uh, force every uh, value to be a positive, and then we add all that together and divide it by um, the number of terms. Okay, uh, number four. Make sure you guys have both. Um, based solely on the given mean, median, mean and median, decide on the shape of each distribution. So the shape is either um, uh, symmetric, skew right, or skew left. So if the mean and median are close together, we know that everything is pretty balanced. So this is going to be symmetric or approximately symmetric. Here, the mean is a lot lower than the median, and why is that the case? Yeah, there's going to be an outlier, right? There's going to be an outlier that is basically forcing that average to shift down. So skew left. And we don't look at the box, we look at the, the whisker, right? Whichever side has a longer whisker is going to be the direction of your skew. Here, the mean is a lot higher than the median. So that means there's an outlier that's on the right side, right? That the outlier on the right side is pulling that mean um, to be a larger value. So maybe something like this. Right. That's going to be a skew, right? Okay. Number five, give a set of numbers that would have a mean absolute deviation of zero units. So another word for mean absolute deviation is spread. So can you think of a set of numbers that have zero spread? The same numbers, right? Two, 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 right? There's no distinction, right? Everything is just at one number. So the, the, on average, there's not going to be any spread. Now, if it was two, three, five, six, seven, then there's more spread amongst numbers. But if there's no spread, then then I mean that's deviation is going to be zero. Right. Right. Does that be these numbers? But as long as they're all the same numbers. Okay, let's go to page um, 11. And our today's notes was standard deviation. Now, standard deviation is very similar to mean absolute deviation. It's just that uh, statisticians tend to use this a little bit more frequently. So, but it kind of has the same idea as telling us how spread out the data is. Okay, so statisticians use standard deviation to discuss dispersion uh, rather than mean absolute deviation. 
The reason that we start off with mean absolute deviation is a little bit simpler to work with, and it's a kind of a good stepping stone to, to introducing a more complicated formulas. Right. So uh, the average of the square difference of the mean is called the variance. And um, usually, if we can get to the variance, then the standard deviation is just one step beyond um, uh, that uh, variance. So think of it as a stepping stone towards standard deviation. So next is standard deviation. It's the average distance from the mean. It tells us how tightly the data are clustered around the mean. So if, if your data is very persistent, then you'll have a very small standard deviation. But if your data is all over the place, then you're going to have a wide, a larger standard deviation. So more consistency means smaller standard deviation. Less consistency means larger standard deviation. Okay, let's just go through this. Um, this is all review. So we'll just kind of get through example one as a way of kind of getting to the second part, the second page, which deals with um, the formulas. Uh, so let's calculate the range of each set for home and away games. Range, what's the formula for range? Yeah, it's so max minus min. Yeah. And then um, you want to look at the back of your of your um, your calendar. It has a lot of the summaries. Um, that you can refer to, right? Range is max, maximum. So we find the highest value, we subtract the lowest value for the home and away games. So there's not an order here. So largest is 45, uh, lowest is 13. So the range of the home games is just going to be 32. Away games, 27 is the largest, 9 is the smallest. So the range of the home games is larger than the range of the away games. Okay. Explain what this means. Okay. We know the difference of the largest and uh, difference between the largest and these points scored is greater than in the home games and the away games. Okay, calculate the mean of each set just to save us some time. We know what that is. Just average, add up all the uh, the numbers in the in the column and divide it by the number of games. Here we have eight games. So for the home games is two thirty seven over eight. For the away games. So on average, um, the team is going to score more uh, during home games than away games. Okay, calculate the IQR for each set. So put all the numbers in order here. I missed the number here. Oh, 234.
Okay, so see if you remember how to find IQR. That means we got to build um, the lower quartile and upper quartile. There's an even number, so we know that all the numbers can be part of the upper or lower quartile. So Q3 minus Q1 is 36 minus 21 for the home games. And if we do away games, Thirty six minus twenty one gives us fifteen. Twenty four point five minus eleven point five. Thanks. So just review. Um, in the top of the next page, sorry, um, I should have put part. E on this page, but everything got shifted. So we can say that the IQR um, of the home games is greater than the IQR of the away games. Explain what this means. The spread of the middle half of the points scored is greater at home games than for away games. So IQR tells us the spread of the middle set of your data or the middle half of your data. Okay, so um, let's go to page. Uh, okay, so page twelve. Now this feels complicated, but I just want to kind of build off of uh, mean absolute deviation, uh, so that uh, it doesn't feel like a whole new process. Okay, so this is what we did yesterday, right? Yesterday when we started off with mean absolute deviation, we knew that we we had the mean. We have each of the terms, we subtracted it, but we forced every difference to be what? To be positive, right? We're still going to do that. Um, the difference here is that we're going to have to take the, the values and we're going to have to square them. Okay. And then that's that's basically the, the additional step we got to worry about. So instead of adding all this up and dividing by 15, we're going to add up all these numbers here and divide it by 15. So it's basically one additional step. There's one more thing we got to do after this, but this is really the main additional step. So I don't want to do think about a standard deviation as just a whole new process. It's really just one additional thing that we're doing uh, to ensure we get something a little bit more accurate. So uh, after this step, we're going to just take these numbers and we just have to square it. Okay, so we have to just be dealing with larger numbers. Okay, we're still going to divide by the number of terms. And there's still one more step to do after that, but um, we're just going to treat it like the first steps of mean absolute deviation. OK, so. So we're going to take the, uh, the, the mean from our home and away games. And uh, take it from the previous page. So the mean of the home games is twenty nine. Point six two five. And the away games is 19.25. So the table already kind of sets us up with everything that we need. We just have to insert 29.625, uh, subtract it from each of the terms, but then we got to square it. Okay. So a little tedious, but hopefully you don't find it too difficult. You're just really doing one additional step beyond mean absolute deviation. And if you get a negative number, 
and you square it, it's always positive. So you can just square your negative number and just make sure that everything that you see here are showing up as positives. Okay, so we're basically subtracting every of the home scores with the mean, and then we're squaring it. So now you're going to take all these numbers, add them up, and divide it by what? Eight. Eight, yeah, because that's the number of games. Yeah. Now we call this number the variance. It's it's the sum of the de uh, standard deviation squared. We're not quite at the end, but we have one final step to do. To get from variance to standard deviation, we just take the what? Take the square root. Yeah. So that's so there's two additional steps you got to do beyond mean natural deviation. You got to square everything, and then you got to got to take the square root. So. Oh my, oh, my my bad. I uh, I skipped a step here. So the 773 should go here. And then this um, sum of standard deviation. Sorry, let me just. I had the right information. I just put it all in the wrong space. So standard deviation tells us how spread out apart all the scores are. So, um, you know, it's a pretty wide range uh, of your home scores. Sometimes, uh, you know, they score a loss and then they, they score a little. And then so uh, averages out to be around nine points away on average from the from 29.625. Yes. So that little symbol means standard deviation. Right. This is um, sigma. So that little O with a little tail there. Uh, that's sigma. That's the notation for standard deviation. So we call that sigma. This is the lowercase sigma. And then, like the answer for standard deviation would be nine point. That's right. That's right. Nine point three five. Yeah. So if you're sitting at ninety six point seven three seven three four, you know that something's not quite right because you know that on on average. You know your scores are not that far apart from each other, um, so that helps. Hopefully, that reminds you you got to take the square root. That nine makes more sense, right? That on average, uh, your scores are nine points away from twenty nine point six two five. Okay. I'm going to have you guys copy this down here, and then that way we can have time to do um, the next page here. But the same process here, which is using a different for the away games, a different average, as a different different data sets. Um, uh, Similar to mean absolute deviation, except that we're going to be adding up the total of the, the difference squared. 
And after you get that number, divide it by eight and then take the square root. And really, the, the main point here is comparing those standard deviations. We see that um, uh, even though uh, the scores are not as high at the away games, at least the scores are more, more consistent, right? So on, on average, you're, the, the, the team is scoring only six points away from the average, but um, there's more um, spread amongst the, the, the scores for the home games. So the spread of the data around the mean is greater for the home games than it is for away games. So I guess you could say that um, for the away games, um, the teams tend to, to um, score more consistently, right? So less less variation from uh, from from the average. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can get through page uh, 13. And whatever we don't finish, we can um, we can uh, do uh, tomorrow. But um, let's page 13. Let's talk through that and get some more practice with um, standard deviation. Okay, so Ms. Grant has a problem and needs your input. She has to give one math award this year to a deserving student. But if you can't make a decision, here are the test grades for the two best students. Uh, you have Emily who is um, you know, scoring really high on some tests, but then you know, there are some tests that are not so great, but still not bad. But then you have Jacob who maybe is a more consistent performer, but doesn't score quite as high as Emily. Um, so you know, which of the two students should, should get the award? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but um, you can make an argument that Emily deserves the award because she has a higher potential because she's able to score higher. But you can also make an argument for Jacob that he deserves the award because he's more consistent across all the tests. Um, the whole point is to show that um, even though Emily and Jacob may have the same average, the data is very different, right? You know, which um, student is going to have the higher standard deviation, you think? Jacob. Well, which student has the more has a larger spread? Okay. Emily, right? So Emily will we, we expect Emily to have a larger standard deviation and Jacob to, to have a lower standard deviation. It doesn't mean that one is a better student than the other. It just gives us more detailed information about the data. Okay. Okay, so um, let's just focus on uh, Emily. So let's find the mean. So let's add up all these test scores divided by the number of tests. So there's eight tests here. So 90 plus 90 plus 80 plus 100. And out of all those eight scores, So um, the formula looks messy, but we can kind of break it down into, into multiple steps. We focus on getting the mean first, and then we take all the test scores, subtract it from the mean, get that difference, we square it, we add up all those numbers. That's what that summation means, sigma means. Add up all those numbers, divide it by eight, and then we get the square roots, and that should give us a spread.
really, I mean, we don't have to do this. We kind of just go directly to here if you want, because you can just quickly know that, you know, any negative, you just force the positive. So then we don't even need this column here. But this is, these are the numbers that we're going to be squaring. So normally we would we would stop here for mean absolute deviation, but for standard deviation, we got to do one more step. We got to make this 100, 181, 81 forces before before we can add them together. Okay. But we are subtracting every test score from the mean, forcing it positive okay. and squaring it. And now we can do what? Now we can add all these numbers and divide it by what? Eight. And then you'll get a really large number, but that will get you your variance. You get from variance to standard deviation, we should take the one. Square root. Yeah. So if we break it up into multiple steps, it doesn't feel as, as complicated. So once you guys uh, copy this down, we can finish off the rest tomorrow and um, uh, we'll also uh, do standard deviation from a calculator perspective. So make sure you have your calculator tomorrow. We're still going to stick on this topic, but um, we're going to find ways to um, make the calculator give us that this uh, data information. Back. So um, So our main uh, deviation is 6.75. The variance is 61.25. This is the number that um, uh, the mean after deviation will be 6.75. That's a previous topic, but we'll take this variance, take the square roots, a little more accurate than the mean after deviation. That tells us that, you know, Emily performs well, but her score varies um, seven points from her average. Yeah, there's yeah. Okay, you can get your phones uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll still stick with this topic, but with calculators. So starting next. Sorry, next Monday. Actually, I'm Monday. I'm going to be coming to Thursday. So I'm sure they can see it on my own. Yeah. I think I'm missing a quiz, right? Uh, yes, you're going to miss a quiz, but you should make it up when you reach my back. Thank you.